Testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear yourself? Yeah. But the question is, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> All righty. Welcome back to this week's Yawa. Thanks everybody again for an awesome number of questions. And if this is your first time to the show, make sure and click that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our other upcoming videos. Yeah, we had a lot of great questions. Some of them have actually been repeats from some of our other Yawa episodes. So definitely check those out if you haven't already. And we actually got quite a few requests for training specific videos, vlog style videos, nail trims, ear cleaning maintenance. And those are all videos that we do have in the works and plan on getting to you shortly. But like Ethan said, if you make sure and subscribe, you won't miss any of those. So let's get started answering questions. First question from Z Fontaine 55. Found, found, found. What do you, what do you use for training treats and how long do you incorporate the clicker in training? I would assume it gets phased out at some point with that. Um, do you ever have to recharge the clicker from time to time? Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you for the question. First of all, what we use for treats in training, primarily the dog's food. And we'll even utilize, I would say, dog kibble as a form of a treat in situations where we don't, if we aren't actually at a meal. The other side of it is we do use at this point, um, they're called train me treats. They're, they're on our website yeah, under our recommended real. items. Yep. So store and then recommended items. You can follow the specific product right there. And then um, as far as when does the clicker phase out? We stop utilizing the clicker when we stop teaching things. So anything new that we're bringing up and teaching, we're going to use clickers um, for a majority of that and positive reinforcement. And then as far as recharging the clicker, uh, no. If you did it right the first time, they it's a hard one for them to forget. And we'll even pull it out if we need to really pull some positive focus to a training session. And instantly you click that once, you're like, oh, where's my treat? You know, so it's... It uh, definitely doesn't need to be recharged, but really good question. Next question from Stosi15 on Instagram. Have an 11-week-old GSP that I have been doing clicker training, another clicker training question, with two to three times daily. Sit kennel to both crate and their bed targeting, and he's been doing great. This week, however, he seemed totally uninterested and will just go lay on his bed or lay by the crate which is where we feed him. I usually train with his kibble. Should I switch to a different treat? Any advice? So first of all, I just want to put this little caveat in there. If he's acting off, if he's not acting like his normal self, seems lethargic or lack of appetite, that's sometimes an indication that something is going on other than a training situation. So um, especially if you're seeing, you know, a change in his stool, a change in his body condition, a change in his appetite, that would be something that I would recommend going to the vet, getting checked out, especially an 11 week old puppy. Uh, puppies can go downhill fairly quickly if they are sick. So uh, don't wait too long to get that checked out if you're concerned about his behavior changing. Absolutely. Now, however, if he's completely healthy and everything is fine, other than that, um, I would say you might just be overdoing it. Two to three times a day is a lot of training, especially obedience only based training, and it can get boring. Puppies like a challenge, they like to have fun, and you might just be putting too much emphasis on obedience, structure, and training sessions that he's losing a little bit of interest and just wanting to go lay on his bed and be like, I know this stuff, don't bother me with it anymore. So maybe a little less frequent of training sessions would be a good option. You could try and introduce a treat, uh, like those training treats we talked about, that has a little higher value than his kibble. But ultimately, we want him to still want to work when we are offering those training sessions, and maybe we just need to do them a little less often. A lot of times we say that a little bit of a good thing is a good thing. A lot of a good thing cannot necessarily be a better thing. Uh, you can definitely overdo it, even as far as doing retrieving drills with your puppy. If you just retrieve them to death, basically, they're going to lose interest in that game and want to do something else, entertain themselves, or just give up on the training session. Absolutely. The other side of it, too, could be that you may be overfeeding your puppy and he's not interested in the food like he was before because he's to the point where he doesn't need... He's fat. He's fat. 
Yeah, he's not hungry anymore. But we don't know that. We don't see your puppy's body condition. So we're just throwing out a couple options of what could really be going on. Um, definitely checking out the health of your puppy for the first thing would be our suggestion, though. Good question. Next, we've got uh, S. Thompson 6886 looking to get a second GSP. I have a three-year-old male. Would rec- would you recommend a boy or a girl as a running mate? Current dog has a fair amount of anxiety when not running in the field. I'm assuming you mean anxiety by just gets worked up or is... Or doesn't like to be alone, maybe. Separation anxiety. A little bit more clarification on exactly what you mean. Could help. Would but, help, but um, we'll or, keep answering. Yeah. We'll, not we'll make assumptions. We'll assume. Um, when not running the field or working, but does better around my sister's dog, large female Rottweiler, great with both boy and girl dogs, both in the field and indoor situations. So the big thing here is it's awesome you've waited this long to add the second dog to the family. Um, a lot of people we see try and get uh, puppies piled up on top of each other, which puppies are a lot of work and that amplifies that problem quite a bit. So um, kudos to you for waiting so long. Uh, as far as a boy or girl, I guess the biggest thing is going to be all dogs can get along together. I would say that you have the biggest chance for issues with two intact males or two intact females. You've probably heard the term at one point in time, females being called bitches. And there's a reason for that. And the, it can go both ways. Well, yeah. Bitches will be bitches. Dicks will be dicks. I mean, that can happen, especially if you don't step in and establish pack dominance of you being at the top of that and everybody else is below that and they don't get to distinguish their pecking order by grumping at each other or exerting their own dominance. So definitely stepping in and not allowing that to happen from the get-go, like we talked about in our last Yawa about how to introduce a new puppy to an old dog um, would be an important step no matter what male or female puppy you get. 100%. And so what it comes down to is um, any combination should work. Your greatest chance for um, for failure, let's go with that, would be two intact males or two intact females. But any combination of spayed and neutered or male, female, or two neutered males or all of those things um, can be really good options. Um, I think the biggest problems that you can end up having are going to be individual dog's uh, personality-wise. So you could run into a dog that has issues, and that's going to be with other boys or other girls or whatever. Um, But like Kat was saying, stepping in and and being able to pay attention and teach proper behaviors. And interactions between them is important. It sounds like your dog is super friendly and gets along really well with any dog. So you should be on uh, a good footing as far as introducing a new puppy. The other thing, if you have a male, you didn't mention if he was intact or not, and you get a female puppy, you'll just have to make sure that you're paying attention when she comes into her first heat cycle, that you're not letting any potential accidental breedings happen uh, because females can come into heat as early as six months and having puppies out of a puppy would definitely not be something we would want or recommend happening. Not good, not good. And just one last thing I want to touch on that about Ethan saying your biggest chance of failure could be having two males or two females. That being said, we have males, we have females. They're all intact because they're part of our breeding program Mm -hmm. and the boys get along great together. The girls get along great together. The boys and girls get along great together. And that's because we do step in um, and establish pack roles as well as they have great temperaments and personalities. So they can get along. It doesn't mean you're setting yourself up for failure. Well, we put all of our boys out together yeah. and the expectation is that they get along and our boys get along really, really well. I would have double them up in crates, things like that sometimes. No questions yeah. ever. No. So it, it, it all can be done. It all can be done. Great question. And good luck with your new puppy. Next question, which I think this is a really good one because it's that gets asked a lot and there's been uh-huh. controversial issues with it in the past. So here we go. From Robert Lovell, this is from Facebook. Thanks for asking this question. I have heard you make a couple of comments about the wing on a stick method of training. I recently finished the book Gun Dog by Richard Wolters and curious if you can expand more on your feelings towards this method. His method seems logical to me. So uh, the wing on a string, Ethan wants to interject. I can tell he's got his finger up. First of all, 
Um, Richard Walters wrote that book and did a fantastic job doing that uh, approximately 30 years ago. I think it's like 35 years ago, something like that, a yeah. long time ago. I mean, and I've actually, I have several of his books as well. Um, all information is good information and you can take small pieces from everywhere to learn and build. And I mean, that's ultimately what we did is you learn as much as you can and you find what works best for you and your dogs. But that book was built a long time ago and you are specifically asking about, it doesn't say what breed, but I would say that there's been a big push, especially in the last probably 15 years of dogs, um, becoming more versatile and versatile breeds specifically being pushed more towards that versatility as well as environment changes. So you look at the average dog, um, especially hunting breed dog now lives in with the family, which is not the way that it was 30 years ago, as well as they live in urban environments. In town, yep. Yep. And so all of these things are coming into a drastically more visually oriented dog breeding for retrieving dogs use their eyes breeding for and and then having dogs in these urban environments they look for a job and that job typically involves hunting things with their eyes because that's their only option squirrels birds bugs whatever so we seeing those two things incorporating those two things is going to help with the answer cat's going to give about going on a string <laughs> That was really good background information and definitely necessary so that you can understand where we're coming from. So the wing on a string, getting that fish and pull out with that wing and trying to get your puppy to start visually pointing it. People want to do because it is maybe more of an older school mentality and they want to see their puppy point and they think that's a really great way to start that process. Well, let's face it too. It's pretty cool to, to watch a little, little puppy go. Yeah, oh. for sure. For sure. And <laughs> do it once, do it twice and then throw it away get is what picture. we always say. Yeah, yep. Take a picture, a picture <laughs> and then throw it away. Uh, not the picture, the wing on a string. But the reason is because we don't want to put so much emphasis on the puppy learning to use their eyes to point that yep. they can't make that transition to learn how to use their nose to point, which is ultimately what we're going to want hunting dogs to be able to do is we want them to go out, hunt, search, find birds with their nose. They're typically not going to have opportunities to point them with their eyes. And we would hope that that transition would be, if they do have an opportunity to see it, they're still going to stay on point visually pointing it. Uh, but we want them to learn to use their noses. And we get dogs in for training a lot that we can tell live in an urban environment and play point chichi birds in the backyard yeah. and squirrels in the backyard all day long and entertain themselves that way. Because when we start trying to introduce scent, they're just looking around, looking around. And when they do finally catch on that they need to point that scent, then they're like, now I need to look for it. Now I need to look for it. Oh, I can't see it. Let me move in. Oh, there it is. And they work in until they're right on top of those birds, right on top of those launchers. Um, and that's also not something that we want to do. We don't want that to happen in training because in wild bird situations, that's going to mean that they're overpressuring those birds. Ultimately, what it comes down to is dogs are way too visually oriented now. And that creates problems with pointing sticks and bugs and grass and you, you have a dog that um, it really detracts from trying to get them to actually learn how to use their nose, which seems like something that would be a simple concept. And you would think the dog sniffs and can be able to use its nose, but it's really not. And so not applying more um, emphasis on you, them using their eyes until they've really figured out how to use their nose is ideal. Good question. Excellent question. Next question is from... Gus underscore Bo Eve 11 from Instagram. What age do you start training your dog? Well, depends on what age you get your dog. If you get your puppy at eight weeks old, you start training at eight weeks old. If you get a rescue dog or a dog that's, you know, older from another program, you start training your dog when you bring them home. Uh, the reason that we say this is that they're ready to train starting at that eight week mark. So anytime after that, definitely are golden to start training. So if you waited and your puppy's now four months old or six months old, it's not like you are behind or anything like that, but definitely can start that now. And we usually start that with clicker training, um, as well as we do a lot of things that aren't necessarily formal training sessions. I want to mention that we want to develop these puppies to be great family members, part of the family for the rest of their life. And that includes managing and um, correcting any naughty behaviors before they can be conditioned to those habits. 
So jumping up on counters, jumping up on us, we need to make sure that we're not reinforcing that in a good way where they're jumping up and we say, oh, I'm gonna pet you because you're a cute little puppy. Well, then they're just conditioning and going, oh, I get attention for that. So though those aren't necessarily formal training sessions, we can always start working on those with puppies as well or an older dog if you get an older dog as a rescue or a foster or something. Great question. Next from Shelly Delon. Mm. What should I do with my new puppy in between feeding, training, and playtime? This is an awesome question, and it sounds like uh, with having feeding, training, and playtime that you've got a lot of the things under control. The next uh, that uh, we would do in between that would be crate training. And if you've got uh, a great routine of feeding and training and playtime, you should know when is a, you include some potty sessions outside, making sure they've gone to the bathroom, then spend some time alone. It's just as important for the dogs to get comfortable in their crate while you're at home as while you're gone. People talk about separation anxiety a lot with dogs and that gets wrapped into crate training or they hate the crate or the whatever and they have separation anxiety. What's well, not actually so much separation anxiety as they become... Uh, they negatively associate the crate because they've been introduced to it improperly. Correct. Typically is yeah. the the real reason behind that separation anxiety. I actually just wrote a blog article about this. I don't know if it's on our website yet, but I think it will be either there soon or already there uh, that talks a lot about uh, crate training and routines and things like that. Absolutely. But that's what we would be doing, working on some crate time and getting comfortable being quiet and spending a little alone time. Great question. Next question from Matthias Mays, 1991. It's a longer question, so bear with me. I'm going to read it all. It's going to come up on the screen so you can follow along and not get lost. We are getting a new pup, GSP of course, awesome, at eight weeks old in May. <laughs> It will be outside in a large kennel, grass, and tiled of 500 square feet during the day from 9 to 5. 500 square feet, just so you know, is about 5 by 10 uh, area. So with an hour break at noon, all the other... Did I do math wrong? Math. <laughs> 5 by 10 would be 50. Oh, that's Ooh, a lot bigger than 5 by 10. Yes. Do the math for me quick. All the other time, it will be with us indoors and sleeping in a bench, so maybe a crated bench or something. Um, but how do we introduce and start this? I'll be home for the first week and want to utilize that time to accustom the puppy to the day-night outdoor-indoor situation. I have seen your puppy videos and do realize that's a little bit different than what we've been doing. Um, with our previous GSP, I was working from home in the beginning, so I monitored, trained him up close during the day, and he was older when we started putting him in the kennel during the day and hashtag love the channel. Well, thank you. So did you figure out that math while I was talking? Yeah. 50 by 10 or five foot wide by a hundred. It's a really long run. It's, it's huge. Huge. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, typically we tell people that if they're given <laughs> that much space outside that they're definitely going to potty while they're out there, that is a huge amount of space. An outdoor kennel run is a huge amount of space. So that's completely yep. fine. Um, and then what you're going to need to work on and that could be a struggle is when they're given that much free time from nine to five that they just get to pee or poop whenever they need to, whenever the urge hits them and they don't have to worry about holding it, they're going to struggle potentially with gaining and getting better bladder control. Uh, so they're like, well, I got to pee and I'm out here in my 500 square foot space. I'm just going to pee. Uh, whereas when they're in the house then, or in their crate, then they're going to be like, well, I need to pee. I don't have any bladder control yet because I haven't had to do that. So I'm just going to pee. So you may struggle with some potty training issues, not okay. necessarily. Every puppy can be different and learn a bit, bit differently, but that would definitely be something that I could say you might struggle with as well as if your puppy's not accustomed to being in that crate because they get all that freedom outside all the time that then they're going to fight against being in that crate and resist that a little bit more. So you'll have to try different things to help them settle down in there, but them learning that they need to be okay being in that crate at times as well. And then the last thing I could say that could be a potential issue with that much space um, is, and it's grass tiled, which I'm not exactly sure 100% what that means, but 
puppies are going to get bored from nine to five, even with an hour break at noon, and they're going to find ways to entertain themselves. That's not necessarily doing it to be destructive or malicious or anything like that. But digging is a big thing that could happen in that space, uh, as well as chewing, depending on how that's set up, if it's near the house yeah. or anything like that. So they could do some destructive behaviors We've because they're entertaining themselves. Horror stories. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of <laughs> chewing horror stories we hear when dogs have that much space and that much free time to entertain themselves. So that could obviously cause a problem as well as by the time you get home and you want to work on some training sessions at maybe five o'clock, your puppy might be exhausted because they've literally just played all day and they have no more energy to focus for a training session. So you may struggle with that if you're trying to set up your training sessions for after your dog has been allowed to just entertain themselves and play all day long. Uh, you think about people that send their puppies to doggy daycare and things like that. They get to play all day long with other dogs and entertain themselves all day. They come home and they just crash on the couch because they're mentally and physically drained. So they might not be ready to train. So you might need to do your training sessions in the morning um, before they get that freedom access to 500 square feet of space. Now that I know my <laughs> math was off completely. <laughs> so, but that was a really good question. I hope that we were able to answer that a little bit with uh, my explanation there. I think you did great. And last but not least for uh, part one of this week, we have the scent gal 09. Why are GSPs so hard to potty train? Well, I'm going to say GSPs are not so hard to potty train. Um, some puppies are hard to potty train. Some puppies are not. And I do believe that there's a genetic proponent that goes into that. Just some dogs have a more clean personality or desire to be clean and others do not. The other side of it can go into what your current schedule and regiments and routines are. Um, and that includes exercise, feeding and watering, um, all of the things. So definitely throw in the comments some of those things that are going on or hit us up on Patreon where we can go into more depth about how to answer this question. And help you with your potty training because it sounds like you're having an issue there. So thank you guys for tuning in for part one. We have enjoyed answering your questions. I'm the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Kat the dog trainer. We'll see you next time.